Merci, Monsieur le Président. And if I may, I'd like to continue these brief observations uh, in English uh, for the benefit of uh, having a language balance uh, in this roundtable. Um, I'll try to offer some brief observations on what we've learned um, during those two years, very intense years, uh, looking more specifically at the family side of the project, the matrimonial property regulations. Um, a lot has been done, and a l we actually have uh, a lot of less. We have learned a lot of lessons. Um, I think the most obvious one is that we have to recognize that a lot of good work has been done. Uh, it's been very nice over the last two years to see how the various notariats in the member states have uh, um, put a lot of work in preparing seminars and actually have been very creative in finding new ways to ensure that participants would be able to master complex regulations in, in little time. Um, and throughout the seminars, we've seen the usual gimmicks, such as you know the quiz. I think in a lot of seminars, uh, participants started to play with the green cards and the red cards and the votes. Uh, but it, notariats have also gone further. I remember one seminar where um, the participants could use a microphone which was fitted in a small box, and that small box, actually, you could throw it away in the audience. So the microphone was circulating among the audience during the whole seminar. Uh, and frankly, this, this is quite innovative, but it worked. Uh, so this proves that you can always renew uh, tr the um, um, training methods um, to make it more effective. After those two years, I think it's fair to say that the notaries in the EU are well prepared and they're well equipped to deal with these two important regulations on matrimonial property and uh, uh, patrimonial aspects of uh, partnerships. Um, and especially, they're especially well prepared because this project came on top of a previous project on the succession regulation. Uh, so now, um, if we look at the legal professions in the EU, certainly the notaries are the one which have invested the most in educating their members uh, to work with these new rules. Wherever you go in Europe, notaries would then be familiar with the choice of law, which is offered by the regulation. They will also be familiar with the habitual residence. Um, it doesn't mean that all the mysteries of those regulations have been solved. There remains, uh, there remains some mysteries, just give, to give you one example. Um, Article 26 of the two regulations, which makes it possible for a court to derogate from the uh, normal result of the conflict of law reasoning. It's an exception clause. Um, we've spent a lot of time in various seminars trying to find out how to operate Article 26. And even though a lot of time has been invested, um, 26 does remain a bit mysterious but notaries cannot perform miracles. Um, if there is still some uncertainty, and there is on Article 26, I think it's now time to pass, not the microphone, uh, but the ball to the Court of Justice to clarify the law. So first lesson, a lot of good work, um, very intense investment by the notaries in uh, mastering these two regulations. I think another key lesson is that um, throughout the seminars, we've learned that, yes, we have the two regulations, but EU law does not stand alone. In this field of law, EU law is actually an additional layer which comes on top of national law or next to national law. Matrimonial property was not invented by the EU. Um, all member states have their own rules on matrimonial property and the regulations only offer a coordination of these rules. The regulations aim to make it easier for couples to organize their assets in cross-border situations, but at the end of the day, the actual law and rules which will be applied will be national law. If you have two French citizens living in Germany and marrying in Germany and spending the first years of their marriage in Germany, well, German law will apply according to the regulations. So when you deal with matrimonial property, you deal with a field of law where, yes, the EU has made a, um, 
a serious um, uh, effort to coordinate the national law, but national law remains applicable. Um, and we have seen that there, are, there is a strong diversity. Uh, we still have uh, very specific regulations in different member states. Every member state ha has its tradition. Uh, French notaries will talk about avantages matrimoniaux or the famous récompense. German notaries will be discussing the Versorgungsausgleich. Um, Italian notaries will be discussing the prohibition on unequal splitting of community assets. All these traditions exist and we need to take them into account. When we look at this situation of having EU regulations living next to national law, this brings two questions or two elements to my mind. The first element is a very classic element, very classic element. We look at the situation of those two French spouses living in Germany. According to the regulation, German law is applicable. Now, for a French notary, how is the French notary able to identify the precise content of German law? This is a very old question. It's not a question specific to matrimonial property. And we know that CNUE has done a lot of work in this respect by putting together various online platforms, making information available on the law of member states, information which is available freely. And if we look, I think, at the oldest platform, Couples in Europe, we have today information on 27 countries available in 21 languages on matrimonial property issues. And I've looked at it yesterday again. Um, it's very interesting and um, very nice that the information on national law is directly linked to the key provisions of national law. So if you're looking for information on French law, you will be directly able to see the provisions of the French Civil Code. I myself, as, a, as an academic, I've been using this instrument as a first reference, and I've always found it very useful. But it doesn't prevent us from looking at it a little bit more critically. And if we do that, um, this brings to my mind the following thoughts. In the first place, maybe now is the time to evaluate whether these platforms meet all the needs of practitioners. They certainly meet many needs, many of the needs of practitioners, but do they meet all the needs of practitioners? And more specifically, one question is whether the information offered goes far enough. Does it offer enough details on those peculiarities of national law? I don't have an answer to that. It's an open question, uh, but certainly, um, given the huge success of these platforms and the investment made by the uh, CNUE, it's worth evaluating the tools. Another question is that these regulations, uh, these uh, tools are limited to the law of member states. And this is striking because we know that all European regulations are not limited to purely European relationships with the matrimonial property regulation a notary in Luxembourg could end up applying the law of a third state, a non-EU state, say Switzerland. Uh, now, Switzerland may not be a good example because identifying the content of Swiss law is not that difficult. There are online tools to do that. But we know that in the Europe we live in today, uh, there are many people living in Europe with very different backgrounds coming from far away and even further away. So it may be, may be wise to think about gradually opening up the platform to maybe a few selected non-EU legal systems for which there is a need in, in practice. And I'm realizing by saying this, I'm potentially putting some additional work on the agenda of CNUE, but I believe at least it's necessary to take the time to think about these possible evolutions. Reflecting on how to assist or better assist practitioners in finding the content of the law, the applicable law is one thing. Another thing is um, to understand better the relationship between the EU framework and national law. As I've underlined, EU law cannot simply be thought independently of national law. EU law comes in addition to national law. 
And uh, the honorable judge in her presentation today referred to a number of cases decided by the Court of Justice. For those of you reading these cases, you know that the Court of Justice always um, first attempts to uh, identify the main principles of EU law, but it also takes, takes time to explain the legal system of the member state uh, in which the question arose. So the national law of member state is relevant, and there is a, an intricate relationship between EU law, which is the framework, and national law. EU law is embedded in national law or otherwise. This brings me to two comments. First, a comment on the methods of training. Um, until now, we've had many seminars, and all those seminars always started from the regulations. And this was quite understandable. These were new regulations. It was necessary to explain the principles of those regulations to practitioners. But if I'm a practitioner, the first question I will have in any matter will not be a question dealing with a regulation. The question will arise in my national law. If I'm a French notary, I may be wondering whether the Société d'Aquet, which I'm proposing to my clients uh, in relation to some of the, maybe some of the immovables they have, immovable in France and one immovable in Italy, well, how will that Société d'Aquet play out in Italy? Will it be accepted or not? So the questioning for practitioners does not start from the regulation, it starts from national law. Hence, my, my question, should we not flip the seminars? Flipping the seminars meaning, when thinking about new seminars, not take as a starting point the regulation, but start from national law. Because again, the questions asked by practitioners will be asked based on national law, on their practice, on what they know. Uh, while all the seminars until now, they've been constructed around the regulations. Um, but now we're one step further, so there is room for innovative practice, and one of that practice could be flipping the seminars. Another um, thought I want to share with you relates more to the content. Um, as I said, there is a clear interaction between EU law and national law. And we may need to pay more attention to the interaction, but also we may need to pay more attention to national law during the seminars. Because national law is alive. It keeps evolving. I'm just using two examples. We'll take the example of Slovenia first. As far as I understand, Slovenia has adopted recently a new family code. And that family code is a game changer for divorce because it makes it possible for spouses to divorce without going to court. If the spouses do not have children or minor children, they may divorce simply by going to a notary and agreeing to the terms of their divorce. Now, this is a development of national law, which definitely will have an impact on how assets are split among spouses. So you see, a development in national law may have an impact on the way practitioners in Slovenia have to work with the regulation. Another example is even more recent. You may have heard that yesterday, the French government has introduced a bill in the Assemblée Nationale. It's a very large bill. And one of the elements of the bill is a provision which relates to succession, cross-border succession. And what the French government wants to do is to make it possible for um, a, a, ch a child or a spouse of somebody who died to claim assets in France, more assets than this person would be entitled to under the applicable law, if it is shown that there is a discrimination um, based on the foreign law, discrimination meaning that this child or uh, surviving spouse would get less assets in another country. So what, in a sense, what the French government is suggesting is to create a French mechanism which would be able to redress imbalances in the um, um, cross-border succession. It's very new. Uh, we will need to study this in detail. But it does raise interesting and intriguing questions of whether this is compatible with the succession regulation. And if yes, how this will play out. So again, here, you've got 
examples of uh, national law which keeps changing and which will have an impact on the operation of European rules. Given this, I think there is room to think about a next generation of seminars where national law will be more embedded in the seminars. We should not think of EU law as something different coming from another planet, which stands really apart from national law. The two are um, formed together, the law which practitioners need to apply day in, day out. And I think one good method to have more attention to national law in the seminars would be to pay more attention to the documents. Pay more attention to the documents because at the end of the day, notaries work with documents. They work with contracts, they work with deeds, wills, what have you. The work of a notary is based on drafting, reviewing, explaining documents. And all these documents are strongly rooted in national traditions. Now, from the point of view of citizens, what citizens want is that a document drafted by a notary, say in Luxembourg, can be used in Spain without any difficulty. Free poss possibility to freely circulate with these national documents. Now, we may want to think about um, paying more attention to these documents as a way to open our seminars to national practices. Mrs. Uh, Sastamonen this morning um, talked about building a common judicial culture in the EU. Well, one way to do that, uh, if we want to do this seriously, may be to think about sharing expertise on our respective national documents. Now, let me be clear about this. The goal is not to create uniform European documents. We have a very rich tradition in all member states uh, where notar notaries work, uh, sometimes a very old, long tradition, um, and every national notary has its specificities. But maybe we can try to ensure a better mutual understanding of how EU law works by focusing on the documents, by having seminars where notaries from different member states would share thoughts about documents they work with or documents from other member states, all with the idea of uh, fostering this better mutual understanding of each other's uh, tradition and practice. I realize that I have put a lot of work on the agenda for uh, notaries, but I'm really confident that notaries are up to the challenge. Uh, thank you for your attention.